Hi everyone, um, I'm Sophia and I'm um, part of the marketing team at RSPCA South Australia and um, tonight we've got um, Emma, Shelley, Cheryl and Ryan here to tell us a little bit more about the ins and outs and the nitty gritty aspects of their roles as inspectors. So Emma, you've only been an inspector for the past 18 months, um, how, how did you get into this role? Uh, yeah, so prior to becoming an inspector, I worked at the Lonsdale Shelter for 12 years. Um, I worked in the intake office, so that meant all the animals that came in through me, um, including inspector animals, and that's where I sort of gained an interest in what the inspectors did. Yep. So uh, you started working for RSPCA 12 years ago. What mm. made you first want to get a job um, with us? I was born an animal lover, um, and we would go to the Lonsdale Shelter as a family and visit um, and I think that's what sparked my interest. Yeah. yeah. And Cheryl, you also started at the Lonsdale Shelter? Uh, yeah, I did. I was caring for the prosecution animals. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so. um, can you tell us a bit more about that? Um, yeah. So I spent three years working at the shelter, then just felt that I could do more. Um, and yeah, um, applied to become an inspector. So I've always been passionate about animals and the RSPCA. Um, when I was 16, I caught the bus from where I lived in Port Lincoln up to Wyala to do work experience at the shelter. So I knew I'd probably always end up an inspector. <laughs> and um, Shelley, your background is slightly different. You're actually a vet nurse. Uh, yeah, I started um, actually with animals at the Animal Welfare League. Uh, I worked there for about seven years before I made the move to RSPCA. I uh, started there as a volunteer just to um, get some animal handling experience. Uh, from there, I ha I've got a very curious nature um, and that actually landed me in the vet clinic. Uh, I was very lucky to be trained up by very experienced uh, vets and nurses there. Um, so in the last few years, I was a regular vet nurse and managing the cattery as well. So I'm very grateful for the skills and the knowledge that I got um, working in the vet clinic there as well. And um, you've got a little friend here today. Can you tell us a bit more about him? I do. Um, this little guy is a, a 10-month-old Bichon. Um, his name is Mochi. I'm not sure how much longer he's going to last on stage, so he might do a bit of a, a run in a minute. Um, Mochi actually came into our, our RSPCA care through the inspectorate. Um, I, his case is actually currently ongoing, so I'm not able to say much about it. But what I can tell you is um, when he came into our care, he was seized with three broken bones, um, a pretty serious head injury and brain injury. Um, and he, he has been in foster um, while we have had him, yep. And um, Cheryl, like Shelley, um, and pretty much most of the inspectors, um, you two are a foster carer. Yeah, I am, unfortunately. <laughs> but I love it. I mean, we, um, we often bring our work, our work home um, with us. Uh, currently, I have a little tiny Kelpie mixed breed dog um, fostering with me. So he, with his other four siblings, had spent his whole life living in a chicken shed, uh, converted in somebody's backyard. So he doesn't have any social skills. He'd never been on a lead. He couldn't have been in a car, never seen a TV, um, and he's just beautiful, but I'm just trying to help him um, help him adjust to life so he can go on to find a new home. And um, Ryan, like Shelley, you've had various uh, experiences throughout your life that have led you to become a RSPCA inspector, and as a kid, you wanted to be a vet too? Yeah, that's correct. So I grew up uh, dreaming of becoming a vet. I went through three work placements when I was in year 10, I was lucky enough to go to Western Plains Zoo in Dubbo. I uh, worked with the zoo animals there with a vet. Uh, I did two small practice uh, vet placements as well, which was fantastic, but ultimately I decided that I wasn't going to be confined to a clinic. I wanted to work with animals, uh, but not necessarily as a veterinarian at that stage. Mm -hmm. and, um, and from there you had a variety of animal related roles? Yeah, that's right. So um, I then went on to, I've, I've done a multitude of things all over the, the country, however um, I think the things that contributed to uh, gaining this position, I was a horse riding instructor, uh, worked for Biosecurity Queensland uh, doing pest management and uh, eradication and, um, and also doing local laws and animal management in remote indigenous communities up Cape York. Had you ever thought of becoming an inspector? Yeah, so I reckon about 10 years ago, I, was, uh, I had some dealings with the inspector in Cairns and I thought that, that was, you know, like, I was like, well, this guy's my hero. And, um, and yeah, I just thought, you know, my, my experience at that stage probably wasn't up to par. So I thought whilst it was a great job and this guy was my hero, there was no way I was ever going to get that job. Mm -hmm. And um, how did you feel on your first day um, down here in SA? 
Yeah, so uh, when I came down here, I flew down for a trial and I was lucky enough to go out with Cheryl. Um, and uh, we approached this property and they had basically tried to pull the wool over Cheryl's eyes, so to speak, with uh, the dog that was at the property that we were there in question for and um, basically said it had been euthanised by an off-site vet, but they couldn't confirm that. And uh, going off a bit of a hunt, Cheryl and I went around the corner. We called police and waited for them because these guys started to kick off a bit and, um, and went back there with police and basically they just sort of gave up, brought the dog out to us um, who was in an exceptionally poor state at that stage and, um, and you know, carried on a bit and um, and I was sort of just in awe of the fact that Cheryl knew the dog was still at the property initially. Um, the fact that we deal with these types of people mm -hmm. and um, and yeah look I was I was pretty pretty scared at that stage just because of everything that was happening you know it, it, it wasn't a game it was real life and these were real people with real life issues and um, and yeah I was just basically in awe of Cheryl's ability to see through it. Cheryl do you remember that day? Yeah, that was an interesting day for him to come down. Um, they really did kick off um, at the door and were yelling and screaming and we seized the dog and, um, yeah, look, I mean, I can spot a liar. You, you learn in this job. Um, I don't, can't count how many times I've gone to a property, there's been a thin dog and I've said, you know, what are you feeding it? Oh, I'm feeding it loaf and these biscuits and, you know, a little bit of caviar on top. Oh, can you show me the packets? Oh, I just ran out this morning. <laughs> how many times I've been told that and people say it with such conviction that they actually think that I'll believe them so um, but yeah Ryan's pretty good now at spotting a liar as well so um, I guess it's a skill you you kind of have to learn yeah, it is. <laughs> um, you've been an inspector for many years eight to eight, pretty much eight um, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you've seen almost too many instances of cruelty what's some of the hardest things that you've seen Oh, look, it can be really difficult. I, I think what I find quite upsetting are, are older dogs um, that may have been cared for by their owners for their entire life and maybe never needed some of that extra care. And as soon as they need the extra care, they're not provided with it. And um, it, it's just awful having to seize an older animal, um, especially if it needs to be euthanised, if it's at that point, and not have the owner there. It's really, um, it's really sad for it to end its time that way. So, Yeah. And Emma, is it really hard when you sometimes don't get the results that you'd hoped for? Yeah, definitely. It, it, it's a struggle sometimes, but um, I guess we just focus on the positives and learn from anything we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shelley, your first case took uh, about two years to finalise, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, my The first dog uh, I ever seized um, was a dog that was later named Clifford. Um, and as you say, it took over two years to, to finalise. Um, I The reason it took so long to finalise is the owners basically denied that it was their dog. Um, he was in absolutely emaciated condition, um, you know, and I don't think I'm far off from saying that he was, you know, only days from death. Um, but he, you know, actually the next, the next morning when he pooed, um, he had nothing but tree nuts, uh, those orange palm tree nuts in his, his poo. So it was pretty obvious that he hadn't eaten in days. Um, whereas these people were trying to tell me that they, he was a stray um, and they'd felt sorry for him and, and they took him in trying to fatten him up. Um, so, look, I worked very closely with a, a family member of theirs for the next 18 months um, trying to explore avenues of ownership. Um, there was no council records, there was no vet records. The, the neighbours could give me a little bit of information but not enough. Um, so I spent uh, countless emails, texts, phone, phone calls uh, and sharing photos of, of Clifford um, as well. Um, and in the end, um, there weren't really any other avenues that we could go down. So this very brave family member decided that he needed to do what was right for, for Clifford and he gave us the evidence that we needed to secure the, a successful prosecution. And um, obviously the fact that you can't always save every animal that you seize must be really hard. Yeah, look, um, one of the hardest things about being an inspector is, um, as you say, uh, not being able to save them all. Um, you know, if we are at a, a situation where we need to seize an animal, that animal is usually in a very critical state. Um, and sometimes euthanasia is the only option. Um, we, uh, people will often ask us, you know, well, why couldn't you try this and why didn't you do this? But it, it's very complex. Um, we need to think about the animal, um, you know, not what we would want to do. And it is, a, it is a decision that is made by a whole team, so it's not one person. So we know that it's the right decision in the end. 
Um, I think, you know, likewise, getting to a job too late as well. I think we've probably all walked into a, a property where we have unfortunately stumbled across an animal that's starved to death. Um, and, you know, I myself have actually pulled a, a deceased dog from a car. Um, it had been in the car um, for five hours, overheated and died. Also, um, long-term long neglect, um, you know, those really chronic long-term neglect cases as well where I will, you know, I'll talk to the owners um, and they tell me that this is their beloved family pet but they've looked past, um, looked past these, you know, that animal being in pain and suffering for, for such a long time. Those are the ones that really stick with you and, and they're really difficult to understand how that's happened. Um, a good example of that of mine um, is an eight-year-old Rottweiler, Tex. Um, some of you may be familiar with his story. He had a little story on, on Facebook. But his owners, who have since been prosecuted, um, they ignored his chronic ear infections and skin disease for, for eight years, his entire life. Um, and he was... Uh, it was very obvious that he was in pain um, every day of his life. And he... In the end, he needed to be put to sleep. Um, we did explore some pretty drastic issues, uh, sorry, some pretty drastic measures to try and fix it, um, but there just wasn't anything else that we could do. Um, you know, and he was a beautiful dog. He was a really old soul and he deserved so much better. Cheryl, over your eight years, um, I'm sure you've seen similar instances to Tex. Yeah, lots of different things, um, but, you know, very similar um, to that. Um, I mean, I, for me, I think something that's always... I've found quite upsetting has been um, selective cruelty when there's a favourite dog in the house um, that's given love and you know comfort and food and then there's been the other dog. Um, I think my first prosecution um, was an emaciated dog called Mazza. Um, he was just a walking skeleton and his owners lived with, two, uh, with another couple. So there were two couples, one each had a dog. The other, other couple were feeding their dog um, and... Mazza's owners weren't feeding him. So I, I found that quite distressing because just the idea of Mazza wasting away and getting to that point, but playing with the other dog in the yard and smelling the food on his breath and hearing the, t you know, the bowl go down. Everyone knows who's got a dog, you know, as soon as they'll run, you know, as soon as that sort of bowl hits the floor. And the idea that he was listening to that and smelling the food and, and hadn't been fed, um, yeah, it's just awful. Um, and, you know, I've had... Another matter um, I found quite upsetting was uh, an emaciated staffy um, in the backyard tied up, um, you know, ripped up bag of home brand biscuits. But in the house they had a, a cavalier puppy that was about six months old, overweight. They showed me their special food. Oh, but we care for this one. So one dog was starving and, and one dog was, um, yeah, getting everything it needs. So I don't understand how people can do that. But, yeah, I've always found that quite disturbing. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, Emma, as inspectors, you can often be faced with acts of animal cruelty caused by mental health issues. Um, how, what's this like? It's really it's tricky for us because we then need to address the issues to do with the owner and the dog. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times we'll try and educate them and, and work with them, but mm -hmm. sometimes just that's not successful. How do you go about working with the owners? Uh, we'll call in external groups and parties, mm -hmm. so people that can work with the owner. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times we'll try and educate the owner as well um, and work with them and check up on them regularly to see. Yeah. And uh, Ryan, how does your role as an inspector affect you personally? So... We all do this job because we love animals um, and, um, yeah, look, we, we do. We see some horrific things um, and quite frequently, unfortunately. So uh, for me personally, it's, it's, it's equated to sleepless nights um, and, you know, I, I get angry over it. I, I, I have real issues controlling my anger towards people and how they could possibly do that to animals and I've sought counselling because of it because I was, I was. I was spending, you know, nights upon nights just laying awake um, not being able to control my emotions because of what I've seen. And then, um, you know, you go to a job and you think you've seen it all and then some twisted individual stepped it up a notch and that, yeah, it really gets you. And Cheryl, Chief Inspector Andrea mentioned earlier in her keynote um, that several female inspectors have been assaulted over the past few years. How does this make you feel and, and your team, um, like how do you protect your team going out? 
Yeah, look, it's it's awful um, when things like that happen um, to my colleagues who are just doing their job. Um, I mean, look, we're lucky. We've got body-worn cameras. We have dress pendants like what Emma's wearing. Um, these kind of things can help us stay safe. Uh, we are very aware of our surroundings um, and we're good communicators. Um, yeah, so which sort of helps to keep us um, safe. We do sometimes attend in pairs um, and can take police if we have a, a known violence issue at the property. Um, but yeah, look, it's sad. Um, one of the inspectors that was assaulted um, wasn't able to return to work even though she tried because the trauma that she just kept reliving just made it too hard. So it was really sad for someone that um, was so passionate about their role to have to leave. And um, Shelley, is it sometimes hard not to give up on cases that you think might ever end and it really gets you down? Yeah, uh, look, going back to, to Clifford's case, the emaciated dog that I, I spoke about earlier, um, his case, you know, I, I persevered with that for, for over two years. Um, you know, our involvement in these matters, it, it, our work doesn't stop when we remove the animal from that situation. There's so much work and so much effort that goes into, um, you know, getting all of the evidence and getting that case into court. And when we, when we get good results in court, you know, those are, those are really proud moments for us and they keep us going. Mm -hmm. Emma, while all finalised prosecutions are obviously big wins, um, are there any smaller wins along the way? Yeah, I think we have uh, daily smaller wins and it generally is around educating it, the owners. Um, it's, there's nothing better than going back and seeing a dog that's gained weight or, um, you know, an animal that's improved because of the um, advice we've given. Yeah. Yeah. So, Shelley, education is a large part of your role then? Absolutely. Um, like Emma said, um, talking about feeding, you know, there's so many people out there that still benefit from just general feeding advice, general advice in, in, um, in anything. Um, we, I, I see it a lot with, with dogs, I suppose. People are still feeding solely a canned diet um, and they wonder why their dog can't put on condition. So being able to be there and offer them that advice and then returning to the property and seeing that, you know, not only that small change in dietary information for, that, uh, for the dog, the impact that it's had, um, and seeing the owners being proud of that as well. You know, we're all very privileged in this room to have the exposure and the knowledge around animals. Um, and we need to remember that, I guess, not everyone has been exposed to that. People will only look after animals to the, the standard of those around them, um, whether that be their, their grandparents, their parents, parents, their neighbours, the community. Um, and so it, it's, it can be a difficult concept to grasp, but we need to make sure that we give them the opportunity to make those changes. Um, anything less than that is a Band-Aid fix and we need long-term change. Um, that's why we need to have conversation after conversation and, and constant contact with people um, so that we can ensure that that happens. So Cheryl, as an inspector, um, you obviously have the ability to positively, positively affect change within the community. Um, how else would you go about this? Yeah, so we look at every opportunity, um, every time we go to somebody's property and meet with a person, that may be the only time um, that that person ever is going to meet somebody like us. So we try to do everything that we can in the household to try to improve the situation. Um, that could be spending 20 minutes teaching them, teach their dog how to stop jumping um, when they walk out the backyard because a lot of people get a puppy, keep it in the house because it's little and cute, then it starts to get too big, they move it out the back. Every time they go outside, the dog staff for attention will start jumping on them. Then they can start going outside less. Then they end up surrendering the dog and they get another puppy and the same thing happens again. So we just look at every everything um, that we can do to try to help and change the situation. Um, so look, education and working with people is always um, our biggest priority. But I mean, look, there, there are the others that some people that deserve to be prosecuted, um, really. And the amount of education, you know, I could talk on blue in the face, it wouldn't help. Mm -hmm. um, I remember one dog uh, that I seized years ago, uh, name, his name was JD, and he, um, he had been owned by somebody um, who lived with his partner. He moved out, left the dog behind. Um, she didn't want the dog but didn't do anything to try to rehome it or get rid of it or open a gate or anything. So she just pretended it wasn't there and the dog started starving and wasting away. Um, she, when we were interviewing her, she said that um, it was starting to upset her every time she walked outside and had to hang the clothes on the line. So she strung a clothesline on her front porch so she didn't have to go outside and look in the backyard. And we were interviewing her on a doorstep with the clothesline there. So people like that 
education won't help, but look, most of the people in the community want to do the right thing and they love their animals. They want to do everything they can and they really soak up the advice and help that we give them. And it's great when you go back, like Shelley said, and you see that they've listened and, and the, yeah, the animal's situation's improved. So um, just to wrap everything up for tonight, uh, and I'm sure you all, do, all would agree that these guys have an incredibly tough job every day. Um, what makes you all come back um, day after day? It's the animals <laughs> we, we take home and fill up <laughs> in our house. Um, yeah, it's for the animals, but also the, the community and being able to change a situation and help a family, it can then make a generational change. Um, so, you know, prosecution, yes, that's good, but that's not, yeah, we want to educate um, and work with people. Mm -hmm. So, cool. Anyone else want to add anything? <laughs> yeah, I think we've talked about a lot of negative things, <clears throat> but um, for me it's the positives and they're few and far between. Um, I think I've just got a lot of bad luck with the cases that I get, but um, I really enjoy seeing a positive outcome. For example, like Mochi, who's running around here somewhere, um, he's chalk and cheese. So the day we seized him to how he is now, um, you, you wouldn't believe he, he was the same dog. So that, that's what keeps me coming back. Uh, I simply want to make people want to look after their animals better. That's it. Simple for me. Um, I think, apart from working with this amazing team, would be the small wins for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, guys. And um, please join me in thanking um, these four inspectors. Thank you.